thank you guys for your patience and letting me get back to you. Um, I was obviously very upset the other day and um, one of the things I've learned is uh, not best to post to social media while I'm upset. And while I am still deeply disappointed, I have time to calm down and I can share with you what I was so upset about. My top two priorities for years, before I ran for council, before I, before I ran for council, have been two things, housing and voter participation and civic involvement, my friends. Those two things have been the most important to me because when I think about policy issues and I think about our goals in building sustainable community, I'm looking for first principles, which is to say things that when we work on them, they solve everything else. So we're treating symptoms, or rather we're treating the disease rather than symptoms. And housing and voter participation are those things because if we don't live here, we don't have a community. And if we do not participate in our governance structure, then we don't have a voice. And the outcomes of our government do not reflect the values and needs of the community. These things are fundamental. And I was so upset because I feel like I failed you. Um, I feel like I have failed this community in the last few days being held what I would see as significant step backwards on housing and voter participation. So I want to break those down for you a little bit and give you a little background on what happened and how we dust ourselves off and get to yes. Because while I might be deterred, I am not done. So housing. Single biggest property we will have to affect housing maybe ever, forward or back, is the Lumberyard. We have over $30 million already invested in just the land. It is off the highway. It is on transit. It is in a place where its neighbors are Comcast and a mini storage. There is no more responsible place to put housing. And we are in a bigger housing crisis than ever before. The 10 units that just went up for rental on Main Street had 167 applications, many of which had more than one person attached to them. So we went into that meeting looking at up to 500 units on that site. And we left with a sweet spot of 300 to 350. So 150 to 200 individuals or families, in my mind, just lost the ability to live at Aspen. And Aspen just lost the ability to house its community. That is such a step backwards. It would be one thing if there were real justification but so far as I could tell, the reason we settle on 300 or 350 is because it was somewhere between the 140 and 500 that were presented. Um, we're living in a time of social justice and the reality is our housing system is unjust. 17.4% of our workforce is category one or earns below $35,000 a year. 1.2% of our ownership units in APJA serve that income bracket. We claim to be progressive. We claim to care about the makeup of our community. And yet, we send almost every single worker of our most in need down Valley on a three hour round trip drive or bus ride and we ask their children to go to schools immeasurably worse than ours. That's not okay. We should be doing the opposite. We should be looking at every housing project and we should be saying, how many units can we add until we make that up? 
until the percentage of ownership in our community reflects the percentage of jobs in our community. Because it would not only encourage a fuller and better and more diverse community, but it would also be the single biggest way we can leverage our privilege, and we have privilege, to lift up communities that are economically, racially, or otherwise disparaged. We can create vehicles of generational wealth that have been denied systematically to populations for generations. And we can do so by putting their kids in the best public schools in Colorado and giving them access to everything that Aspen has to offer. How can we in good conscience cut 200 units rather than add them? At a density, the highest density, 0.47 FAR, which is a third of some of the houses in the West End that sit empty 50 weeks a year. What does that say about our priorities? I respect my coworkers. Rachel Richards makes the argument, for instance, that our housing system is only as good as the project that came before it. And I appreciate that. And what she means is if this was too big for the community to swallow, next time we wouldn't be willing to do it. We will never get an opportunity like this again. And if our mindset is one where we are prioritizing free, empty homes for multimillionaires over the uplifting of our neighbors, then we need to change our mindset. This one ain't over, but it's a big step backwards. Number two, voter participation. This is undoubtedly my personal project. And the reason is simple. Representative democracy works in representing us, but only the us who vote, and only those of us who vote who can actually sway the outcome. It's the 10% of voters that show up at primaries that dictate congressmen. It's the 20% of swing states that dictate presidential elections. And it's the 60% of people that show up at local elections that determine our future. But we are 100% of us. And as a government official, it is my responsibility to ensure that I'm getting the best information that I can to make every decision. And if we don't have 100% of the vote, we aren't getting it. And if we choose to sit back, we will end up with worse outcomes and a worse community. And nationally, our democracy may not survive. So being the community that stands up and says, we are going to fight for full enfranchisement and participation. We are gonna set a goal of 100% voter participation. Even if we never get there, we're setting that goal. And if in doing so, we can provide a model for the rest of the country to follow, then we are doing the single thing that can best help us while helping our nation. And while I'm appreciative that we considered several things and moved some of them forward, they were window dressing and they were easy. When it came to things that had any iota of risk, of cost, this council is not interested. I'm gonna share a couple quotes with you because Frankly, I find them astounding. I can appreciate that people have a different perspective than me. And I recognize that I could be wrong and these people could be right. And yet I'm living in my experience. And in my experience, this is an abdication of responsibility. Rachel Richards. Not about being on the leading edge. Rachel, I love and appreciate you. I really do. You have taught me so much and you know the world. As a Democrat who posts regularly about voter enfranchisement, to choose, and it is a choice, to not be on the leading edge of this 
is to be culpable in the outcomes. Ward, concerned about government involvement in voting. Sorry that ship has sailed, sir. If we don't get involved, who will? If not when, now, and if not us, who? I'm not gonna watch the country burn while we wait for someone else to do it. And Ward asks, am I too old for innovation or to accept new technology? I don't know, Ward. I don't think you are. I think you're a smart dude who really cares. And I think you can accept it. I think you can embrace it. And I think you can champion it. So let's see that happen. Tori. Such a disappointment, brother. I love you and I appreciate your leadership. But before you even got to make a single statement of support, you were already bargaining shop. Can we do it for just a few people? As if you didn't know from all the time we've spent that those things have already been done in many communities. And the whole point of our action is to take the next step and lead. And instead of running a fair meeting of in-depth truth-seeking, you decided that we should finish really quick. Let's be done in 30. And not even let the experts who spent three hours on the phone talk. That ain't a well-run meeting, brother. And lastly, Anne. I am very happy, I am very happy to be at the end of the pack. If that doesn't sum it up, I don't know what it does. So again, I can appreciate other points of view, and I do. I recognize that I could be wrong on this and many other things. Being at the back of the pack. Is that what Aspen's about? Is that what we have come to? Because I gotta tell you, right now, I am pretty sick of the way we are showing up. I know we have alignment. I know we share the same goals and ambitions and dreams, but we are living in a government where we only focus on what's wrong and what we can't do. We look for excuses, we anticipate pushback, we pre-negotiate out of what we know to be right, and we get done maybe 20% of what we can. We stop recycling at the recycling center instead of innovating and focusing on being zero net waste and leading. We talk about resourcing the clerk's office rather than piloting mobile voting and changing our country. We eliminate rather than add units to affordable housing units. We punt and we punt and we punt. We are better than this. We are more resourced, we are more capable, we are stronger. And we can do better. And we as citizens deserve a government in Aspen of all places that doesn't shadow and cower and know we can't, that says, yes, we can. We might not know how, but we're gonna figure it out. And if we fail on the way, so be it. But we're in this together and we're going to do something big. That's our history. That's our lineage. That's our story. The Aspen that I revere is the Aspen of the 40s and 50s and 60s. The Aspen that said, we are going to be the place in the world for people to come together, to recreate, to think, to connect, to engage in the arts. We are gonna be world class. And to this empty place that there were so little interest that you could literally pick a house out and own it they made it happen. Since the 70s, we're living in a world where we just say no to the things we don't want. And I'm done with that. I wanna go back to how it was how it was and start working towards the things we want. Because if you want a reminder about how important people and our choices are, you need only go to the other side of Ajax where there's a little town called Ashcroft that's just as beautiful, just as remote, just as accessible as Aspen. But at some point, the people there said, only no.
that's what I got. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for hearing me out. To my colleagues, thank you for listening with a critical ear. And thank you for recognizing that I am not impugning you, or your character, that I respect that you could be right and I could be wrong. But on this, we have some fundamental disagreements. And I must speak. That's my job. And together, we will come to the best solutions, whether they're the ones I want or not. But if you think I'm gonna stop fighting and stop pushing, you're wrong. And to those of you watching, if anything that I just said resonates with you, it will not happen without your support. You may have put me here to be your voice, but without your voices, and without the voices that say, yes, we can, and yes, we will, we will continue to fall back into the old ways of no, we can't. And I just can't abide. Thank you. Have a beautiful day. Be blessed. Namaste. <laughs> right here. And do the spark. <laughs> Cheers.